this Hangout on Air is live. This is our weekly help session. It's uh, September 17th here, where I'm at. 5 a.m. And uh, we'll give time to people to gather up here. Um, we don't have anyone in the live webcast yet. If you are attempting to join the live webcast with your webcam, uh, you would be a member of the class. And I sent out an email. You should have that in your inbox and with uh, a link on how to get here. If you are watching over on Google+, Plus, um, then you should be able to, to interact a little bit. You can't do it with your webcam, but what you can do is there's a Q&A section there. You can submit questions, and I'm happy to talk about those. We had one submitted ahead of time, and we'll address that very first. And then finally, if you're watching over on YouTube, you can watch. But if you want to submit questions, you will need to go over to Google+. Plus. So that's plus.google.com. Do a search for me, Curtis Judd. And uh, over there on the page, if you view the Hangout on Air over there, you can submit questions. So there's the background information. And uh, again, we'll give people a few minutes to gather up here. If you're watching this on YouTube, I'm not, I'm not posting these publicly. So um, that's not really the intention. Maybe we'll change that at some point in the future, but I'm not doing any editing or anything of that nature. So um, you may have to skip forward a little bit to get to the point where people start asking questions. So the, the first question I received, uh, let's see here, let me get back to it. Mm. Was from one of our members uh, of the course. Let's see if I can find it here. I apologize. I don't remember who submitted this, but uh, I don't have it in front of me right now. The question was, and I think it was a very good question, so we'll go ahead and address it here and get started. And the first question was, how do I make a lavalier microphone recording sound more natural? And I think that's, that's a great question because, first of all, lavalier mics, in my opinion, don't sound very natural, and it doesn't matter doesn't matter which lavalier mic you're using. They just don't sound natural. There's a few reasons for that. Number one, you usually mount them on the person, the talent, you know, usually right here on the front of their chest. And with the proximity to the chest, that that's a bad, you know, huge advantage in a couple of different ways. Number one, it keeps the mic close to the talent. So wherever they move, it's with them. Um, you don't have to have someone booming and they can walk around and it doesn't matter, it's always with them, great. That's, that solves one really big problem. Um, so that's the good side. The bad side is, is that because it's attached to them, it sounds different. Because a lavalier microphone is usually attached right here on their chest, uh, especially for men, with men's voices, with the deeper voices, um, particularly if they have an especially dark voice, very deep, resonant voice that's going to pick up all that sound from their chest as well and so that doesn't tend to sound very natural it can sound very good it's a very nice sound in some cases but it doesn't i wouldn't call it natural by any means so there are two main things i can think of one in production you can do one thing in post-production you can do first of all if you can during production if you can mount the mic off to the side a little bit that will help avoid some of the resonance from their chest um, if you're having that problem with their particular voice. So again, off to the side just a little bit, um, usually over here at the side of their chest as opposed to right in the center of their chest, can make a big difference in terms of how the mic sounds. Typically that will open up the top end and you'll get a lot more high frequency response out of the microphone. And that'll, that'll work pretty nicely. So that's the first thing you can do. Second thing you can do is gonna be in post-production. And um, let me just, demonstrate for you what that looks like. Let me see if I can share this here. I'm using Adobe Audition here. We're gonna screen share. We're gonna give this a go, see how it works. Okay. I don't know if that's showing. Present to everyone, let's see what happens here. Stop. Uh, 
Okay, trying to share Adobe Audition. Stand by. <laughs> We're getting that up on the screen here. Okay, here it is. Share that. Okay, you should see Adobe Audition now. All right, so what we've got here, just a simple audio clip of dialogue audio. And I can't actually play the audio for you here, but I can show you what I would typically do to make this sounds a little bit more natural. Again, this is a lavalier recording. The question was, how can I make a lavalier recording of dialogue sound a little bit more natural? Um, in addition to, to mounting the microphone off to one side of the chest, so you don't pick up as much of the resonance from the chest, the second thing you can do is apply some EQ. And typically what I would do is I'd come in here, get a parametric equalizer. We'll go back to default on that. And usually I'm going to use a high pass filter um, or a, a low shelf filter. They're pretty close, but kind of a little bit different. Usually the high pass filter is used for really kind of aggressively rolling off the low frequency sounds. That's what's represented here on the left-hand side of the, um, the graph here. That can help some, and you can actually roll that all the way up. So usually most voices in most cases are going to be not going to have a lot of material below 80 hertz here. You'll see stuff down there, but that's not actually necessarily the voice. <laughs> um, but what you can do is roll that off. So if you could just kind of start playing through the audio, and while you're playing through it, start moving this up to the right, um, find an area there where it makes the voice sound more natural. And that's a big thing you can do to kind of roll off those low frequencies. Um, so high pass is one way to do it. You can also use the low shelf. Uh, let me show you. This one's a little bit more gentle, you can see. And you can, in ad addition, this is the built-in equalizer, the parametric equalizer. You can change the steepness of the shelf there. I'd usually go with something a little bit more aggressive and then just sort of roll that up gently until you get to a point where you feel like it's sounding a little bit more natural. So those are the two main things that I would do as far as making a recording that was done with a lavalier microphone sound a little bit more natural. Again, that's one of the big downsides of a, stop that, of a lavalier microphone. Lavalier microphones, plain and simply, just don't sound that natural typically. <laughs> and so if you need a natural recording, first thing I guess I would recommend is try and get a boom mic in there because that's almost always going to sound more natural than a lavalier. So thanks for that first question. I appreciate that. It looks like we do have a viewer here. If you are interested in asking questions, make sure you watch this over on Google Plus as opposed to YouTube. I don't know where you're watching right now, but if you go to uh, Google Plus, you'll be able to actually submit questions. And that you can do that by going over to plus.google.com, doing a search for Curtis Judd. And there on my profile page, you will find the link to actually watch this Google Hangout on air and actually submit questions as well. So go ahead and feel free to submit your questions. I'm happy to address some of those. While we're waiting for some of that, uh, can share some of my recent mistakes in production. <laughs> Again, this is this these help sessions are designed mainly for um, those that are enrolled in the production sound course that we recently produced. That's available over at school.learnlightandsound.com if you're interested in that. But one of the, I had just finished production, let's see, today's Thursday, my time. So it was Tuesday, we did production for a corporate video. And um, we did not have the benefit of using, just to kind of in, in the same line of thought that we were talking about before, lavalier mics. We didn't have the benefit of using a boom mic, unfortunately. The actors were moving around. We had to, we had, let's see, three different locations that we were shooting at. And uh, they were some challenging situations. One of them was supposed to be a reenactment of a of a an airport terminal, and actually, it was in the front lobby of an office building. There was a huge, huge waterfall feature <laughs> right behind where they wanted to shoot, um, and that's fine. You know, you're not going to go for a perfectly clean sounding dialogue studio kind of sounding. Thing. When you're standing right in front of a waterfall, obviously you need to have the waterfall sound in there as well so that it doesn't take them out of context. That was one of the challenges. The other challenge was in an office area with cubicles. And that was a challenge because um, the, the office, it turns out, I didn't realize this before, but it turns out that this particular office, not only did it have the ventilation system, 
that was, um, you know, kind of blowing air out at the microphones and everything else. But there was also, it turns out, white noise generators in the ceiling about every 10 feet. And what the white noise generators are intended for is to, is to kind of put this white noise out there so that every noise that an employee or worker makes isn't, isn't carrying a lot you know, to their fellow workers and the other people in the office. Well, the problem is, is that then you have all this white noise. And when you mic that up and you gain up your mics enough so that you can capture, you know, the best audio you can of the dialogue of your actors, that is very prominent. And uh, so we had this one scene and I knew it was happening and there was nothing I could do at it, about it at the time because, again, I was, I was operating camera and, and we were doing a multi-camera shoot. So I had two cameras going. I had the sound going. had my sound bag on a cart um, trying to manage all of this. And what was happening is we had the female actress was, was standing underneath one of the vents. <laughs> and that's exactly where the director wanted her just because of the, you know, the visuals and what, how things looked. Um, and we had a, just an absolute mess of an audio track on that particular one. So what I ended up having to do is in post, I ended up having to do some pretty serious cleanup. Um, also a lesson learned there was in addition to that cleanup that I had to do, I ended up using Isotope RX4 Advanced. Now that's expensive software. And I understand most people won't have the, the means, at least enthusiasts won't have the means to purchase that. It's like $1,200 US. So, um, but it has state of the art. It is fantastic noise reduction algorithms they have in there. But um, what else I had ended up having to do, and this is a thing that I haven't covered in the course just yet, but we will have an upcoming session on this, is that I had to capture some room tone, just kind of the ambient sound of the room. And I had to, after cleaning up the dialogue as best I could, I had to lay back in some of that room tone to kind of help sell the overall feel of the soundtrack. Um, so we had the dialogue from both the actors and then I laid back in the, the room tone underneath that. And the nice thing is if when you capture room tone separately, you can kind of dial in how loud you want it to be so that it sounds natural. So that was kind of a, you know, one of those cases where I absolutely had to have room tone recording, a separate room tone recording, which I recorded after we did that take. And uh, that saved my, <laughs> saved my tail, if you will. So definitely some things learned there. Um, I don't know if we have these, if uh, new viewers here are coming in over YouTube or Google Plus. If you'd like to ask some questions, I'd love to have you come over to the Google Plus page to watch us. You can actually submit those questions there on YouTube. I can't see the questions. So if you go to plus.google.com, do a search for me, Curtis Judd. Um, if you view the Google Hangout on air over there, you can actually submit questions. And I'd love to answer those questions. Actually, let me just, let me see if I can go to the YouTube page and if I can see that. I don't. I don't get them in real time. I, I know that for sure, but let's check here. And if you're a member of the sound production course, uh, check your email. You've got a link that you can actually join via webcam and be part of the conversation here. So uh, feel free to do that. All right, we're heading to my channel. I'm not seeing it. Let me just go back to the YouTube home. I'm sure it's there. It's got to be there somewhere. Yeah, for whatever reason, I'm not seeing it. Um, if you are there, again, if you are watching over at YouTube, I would invite you to come on over to Google+. Plus. So plus.google.com. Do a search for me and view the Hangout on Air over there. You can submit questions that way. So go ahead and submit your questions if you have any. Otherwise, I'm just going to keep on talk and audio until I get some questions there. Um, actually, let me see if I can just put the direct link for you for the event. Copy and paste. And here are the group chat. Here is the link. Uh, I don't see, that's the thing is, I don't think it's gonna show that on Google plus. So you're not going to see that on YouTube. I don't know. In any case, there is a link if you, if you didn't get it already. All right. Um, so upcoming in, in the course there, um, 
there are a lot of things we've covered already. One of the things that will be going up soon is how to hide lavalier microphones. Um, that was another experience I had that was kind of interesting on this production earlier this week. One of the things that um, we had an actress and we had a variety of different actors in this particular piece. Um, in terms of hiding the microphones, I had a rough time getting the, the mics on the actors hidden well. In some respects, miking up a woman is can be quite a bit easier. <laughs> Let me explain what I mean. Um, we wanted the, the mics to be out of the shot in as much as possible. I didn't want to see them. Um, same with the producer and the director. They didn't want to see it. So what we actually did for the woman, which was which made things a lot easier, is that um, obviously she's wearing a bra. Um, the best way to hide a mic on a lavalier mic on a woman is actually connect the lavalier mic to the little strap between the two cups on the bra on the underside. So it's closest to her body. And then you just run the cable out her back. Um, and then you've got the belt pack transmitter on the back of her, um, you know, the back of her belt there. And that worked really well. Um, it was completely out of view. I didn't get any clothing noise whatsoever. So loving up a, a woman is a lot easier than a man. <laughs> so that's just a little trick. If you, if you weren't aware of that already, that is one thing you can do. Um, for the men, it's a lot trickier because you don't have any obvious places that won't get rubbed by clothes. So uh, what I've actually found in, in terms of the different things I've used, Rode, if you're using a Rode lavalier mic of some sort, Rode makes the Invisalov system. That works pretty well. I do like that. And I've got that. Um, and what that is, it's a little kind of silicone thing that you stick the mic in. In fact, I think I've got one right here I can show you. Oh, no, it's not right there. They are tucked away in my, in my, uh, over there. Can't show it to you right now, but it's a little silicone thing. Um, it's about, you know, it's, it's smallish, but you can fit it. You can, it actually has a space where you can insert the Rode Lavalier or the Rode Smart Lav Plus. Um, and then you can, you can hide that somewhere on the talent, usually under their clothes again. Um, and um, usually I'll just use gaff tape or you can use toupee tape or wig tape to attach that to the talent. The problem with that is you still get some clothing noise. If the clothing rubs across that, you're still going to get some noise. Um, what I would recommend typically is if you can, you want to tape on both sides. So if I'm going to hide it just under here, say, for example, I'd want to tape it to this shirt underneath, but then I'd also want to put some tape on the other side so that I kind of sandwich it between the two layers of clothing so that when the clothing moves, it doesn't rub past the microphone. That can help a whole lot. So that's where things get a little bit more complex. And in fact, I'll be honest, in this last production we did earlier this week, I ended up having to um, actually just clip the mic on the guy's lapel because we just couldn't find a spot that worked cleanly. Every time he was moving, we were getting picking up all sorts of sound from his clothing moving, just the, you know, just what he was wearing and, and how he moved just wasn't working. So we ended up having to actually hide it as best we could. So we actually taped the, the cable underneath, but the mic was sticking out just a little bit. So um, we tried our best. Um, one thing that I do have to order for myself, and I have used them in the past, Rycoat makes a product called Undercovers. And uh, let me see if I can actually find that and show it to you, what it looks like. Let me just do it at bnh.com. Right coat undercovers. Yeah, let's show this to you here. And I can share that. Um, here. Share. Okay, there we go. So here at BNH, we have the undercovers from Rycoat. Um, not too expensive here, less than $20 US. The way it works is you have this little adhesive piece right here. Just shaking my pointer here so you can see where we're at. And it's a little dot and it has sort of this felt thing. So you, you adhere that to the clothes under, you know, underneath wherever you want to adhere it to the person. You place the microphone on it. It has adhesive on both sides. So you put the mic on that and that sort of Here's it to the dot, and then you have a little kind of uh, cover. It's like a felt piece that you put over that, and that helps uh, reduce the clothing noise. So, and, and obviously the wind noise. 
So those work really well. I actually did those. If you haven't seen it before on YouTube, I did a piece. I actually was just helping. I wasn't on camera for my friend Levi Whitney. He has a channel called Uphill Cinema, and he did a review of the Canon XC10 camera. So I helped him shoot some of those scenes there, um, mostly the talking head. And we had him wearing one of these, and it worked really, really well. He was moving around, walking around, waving his arms, <laughs> doing all the sorts of things that talent typically do. And using these Rycoat overcovers. Oh, sorry, these are the wrong one. I need undercovers. Show you the undercover. Here's the undercover. Here's what it looks like. Okay, so here's the thing: the adhesive, double-sided adhesive that you stick to someone's clothing. You put the lavalier microphone on that. The adhesive holds it in place, and then there's this felt type of thing you stick over all that, and that's what prevents the wind or the clothing noise as much. So, see a couple other pictures here. There's the adhesive. That's what it looks like when you first stick it to them. You take that off, adhere the microphone, and then you cover the microphone with this little felt piece. So work pretty well. I uh, I definitely need to get some of those on order. First time I had used those was with Whitney, with uh, Levi, excuse me. And uh, again, worked really, really well. I like those. So if you have any questions about how to get a lavalier mic on your talent, hidden, ideally, <laughs> there's another option for you there. Um, these are a little expensive. I think this is a set of 100 of them. So that's kind of a bigger kit. Um, and that does cost a little bit more, but you can get, I think you can get smaller kits as well that don't cost quite so much if you want to try them and just see how they work for you. So there you go. Um, any questions again, for those that are viewing live, if you're viewing over on YouTube, you're welcome to view there. If you want to submit questions, however, I, I recommend you go over to Google plus. So go to plus.google.com. Do a search for me, Curtis Judd, and then they'll. Uh, if you actually watch the hangout, hangout over there, you can submit questions, and I'd love to have you do that. Let's see if we have any questions that have come in. We do. Okay, we're going to start answering some of those. We may come back to some other things there a little bit later. Okay, first question here is our friend Manchester Music UK. Hey, you were here last time, I believe. So let's, uh, let's see what you got today. Hey, Curtis, I was wondering what is the best way to position a lav mic for outside in public and pranks, et cetera, would be best to keep the lav mic facing up or down, or what do you recommend? Um, lavalier mics, um, I'm assuming, first of all, most lavalier mics are omnidirectional. So if you are using an omnidirectional mic, that the direction doesn't matter so much. Um, usually I, I usually have it facing up if I have it hidden underneath clothing. If I have it on top of clothing and um, the person's voice tends to be very, very bright, Sometimes it helps to point it down a little bit or down instead of up. So that just takes off some of the edge of the sibilance, the S's and the C's and that kind of sizzling noise that it makes. But typically if you're hiding it underneath, I have it pointing up towards their face. And that works pretty well for me. So I'm gonna select that question. I hope that answered your question. I think so. Typically, you're going to get a fuller response. Also, we talked about this earlier. I don't know if you were on when we first started the session here earlier today. Um, sometimes, if you mount the mic, the lavalier microphone right in the center of the chest, especially on men, you're going to get a lot of resonance from the chest. It's going to sound not very natural. If you're looking for something that sounds a little bit more natural, it can help to mount the microphone off to the side a little bit. It doesn't pick up as much as the chest resonance if you do that. So again, just off to the side a little bit, you'll get a little bit more high end response, high frequency response, and typically sounds a little bit more natural. So great question. Thank you for that, Manchester Music UK. All right, Mr. Daniel Jones has a question here. Again, for those that uh, are looking to submit questions, head on over to plus.google.com, do a search for me and watch the Google Hangout over there and you have the ability to, to submit questions as well. All right, Daniel, let's see. Hi, Curtis, long-term long yeah, term subscriber. Thanks, Daniel. Just found out today I'll be filming a junior theater play, 100 seats with three camera setup. Was just going to use two Rode Video Mic Pros since I won't have access to the junior stars. What do you think? I think that's a great option. I assume in this particular case, um, a junior theater play, I assume they'll be miking at least the primary actors and uh, amplifying that. At least on in the recent uh, school productions I've been to, that's what they've done. So I think the challenge is going to be 
typically on those with a high school budget, they can't afford to mic everybody. And uh, so that's a little bit of a challenge, but um, I think that, that the video mics can work well. One thing you could potentially do as well is um, if you do have an, a recorder with an XLR microphone input or two, um, if you can get to know the sound guy, you could potentially ask for a feed from the soundboard. Again, if they are miking it, if they're not miking all of this is irrelevant and using video mic pros is just a great option. <laughs> um, so that's what I would do is if I get to know the sound guy and I can get a feed from the board, that would be awesome in addition to the Rode video mic pros. Um, but if you can't, then the video mic pros, I think are a great option. Those actually work pretty well at those kind of scenarios. What I, what, you know, and I think some of those that have followed me for a while think I hate those on camera mics and I don't hate them. I just don't find them useful for recording dialogue for uh, like a talking head type of piece, which is a lot of what I do. So if I'm having, if I'm doing a, a narrative type piece and people are walking around, um, just capturing dialogue with a video mic pro on top of your camera, not my favorite thing to do. Better than nothing, but not my best, not the best option. So I think for a theater piece though, it's a great option. Um, again, if you can get something to the sound guy or get a feed from the soundboard, if they are gonna be miking it, I think that's a great choice as well. So good luck with that, Daniel. That sounds like a fun little project. All right. And here we have our friend, unscripted lifestyle vlogger. And I don't, I, you know, if you, if you have, um, by the way, you are a student and I, and I, I'm going to call you V here because I don't know how to pronounce your name. I know I've seen it spelled, but I don't know how to pronounce it. And I apologize for that. But if you can join the, if you have a webcam and you want to join, um, check your email. I sent you a link that should get you into the actual hangout here with your webcam. And we can talk a little bit. I'm so glad you got to join us. Would love to talk to you there. So if you've, if you've got that, go ahead and um, get into the webcam. Let's talk. And I, and I think your name is Valekia or Valetia. I'm not sure. I apologize. I'm probably totally destroying your name, um, but come on and join us here if you can, or if not, uh, love to have you just submit a question here through the Q and a interface over at Google plus. All right. Our friend over at Manchester music UK has another question. All right, can you show me or tell me how to process audio, EQ, compress, limit, et cetera, that has been recorded in public, for example, pranks? Yeah, that's a, that's a tall order on a <laughs> little thing like this, uh, but let's, let's give it a try. Um, I'm just gonna, I, I don't have the ability to kind of do the whole thing, and, and we do have some episodes on my channel. If you haven't seen those before, in fact, let me just, pull one of those up so you can see what that looks like. And probably some of you or a lot of you have seen this before. Heading over to YouTube, let's share that with you. Over here at YouTube. We'll first go to my channel. Under the playlists, under audio and sound for video. We have a ton of different episodes here, but there was one that was actually recorded. Well, first of all, you can get, you can get some that are specific to compression. So for example, here I have one on compression just a few months ago. This one right here, dialogue audio post-processing for film and video is probably the one that you want. Um, the reason did I su suggest that one? I'm not going to play the whole thing here. Um, but, and there's a funny, funny frame phrase there, or freeze frame there. <laughs> um, what that, uh, what this one covers is a variety of things. So it's going to talk about, it doesn't talk about EQ so much. I actually handled that in a separate episode that was more recent. There's another one here called smoothing dialogue with EQ. I think it was, boop, 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 here it is. Here it is, EQ for smoothing dialogue audio. That, that's where you'll see what I have on EQ so far. Um, I have a really old one on sweetening sound with EQ. So, so go ahead and check out that playlist. There's a ton of stuff in there, but this is probably the one that has the kind of the biggest overview of compression and loudness normalization. 
again, dialogue audio post-processing for film and video was uh, back in January, 2015. So January of this year, that probably has the biggest overview. Um, don't really have time to run over the whole thing here. And in the future, I will have a class, um, in addition to the production sound class that we just put out, we'll have a new one coming out, uh, depending on how long it takes me, it's going to take a, a little while, but within the next few months here, we'll have a class on uh, post-production where we'll talk about this in more depth as well. So I hope that's helpful for you. Um, and uh, definitely check those out and let me know what you learn there. Okay. All right, next one. And I apologize again, I'm not sure how to pronounce your name, White, Whites. Um, Hi, Curtis, I want to start learning Adobe Audition to clean up dialogue, etc. I started watching a tutorial series that is so boring and slow, I'm trying to find a better tutorial series. <laughs> Any suggestions? Um, well, I don't know if mine are boring or not. They probably are. <laughs> Um, but hopefully they're a little more focused. Uh, I don't know what it was you were watching before. Again, as we were just talking about, let me just uh, share this again. Again, if you go to my channel here, let's see if we go back. So here's my channel over on YouTube. If you come down to the audio and sound for video, I'm going to just pause that so we don't have to watch that right now. Um, but there are a number of them. So I do have one. There's one for removing hiss in dialogue recordings. Um, so that's that's probably one you'll want to check out. I do have some older ones on noise reduction as well uh, called Sound Rescue. Those were quite a while ago. And I had a really bad recording that was sent to me from one of our viewers. Um, but in any case, definitely check those out. Um, and then I don't know if I talked about it in the, the one dialogue audio post-processing for film and video, the one I was showing before, this one here. Um, but we will have some more. So the one, I think the one of most interest to you in terms of cleaning up the sound in terms of like reducing any sort of background noise or hiss, um, that one is, is probably one you'll want to check out. I will have some more coming up in the future. A couple of things I can actually show you right now. I'm going to stop presenting that and let's go over to Adobe Audition. Share Adobe Audition. Okay. There we go. Um, this is actually a really clean recording. <laughs> so I don't really need to do a lot of uh, cleanup right there. Um, but there are a couple of things you can do. A lot of times the noise floor that you hear that's produced by the microphone and the preamplifier, a lot of that noise is actually um, very low frequency. So one thing you can do is come in here to filter an EQ, get a parametric equalizer. We talked about this before, and it's actually already set up. If you can roll off some of that low frequency, that can help a lot. And typically, I don't I actually don't use this here. I'm gonna. This is a low shelf, and this is a high pass filter. High pass filter is typically the best tool for this job, but just uh, just applying a high pass filter here, and even if you get a little bit more extreme there, this can actually just uh, affects the slope of the cut that you're gonna do here. Um, but anyway, rolling some of off some of this uh, low frequency stuff off can make a lot of difference in terms of reducing that uh, that noise floor that you're getting the hiss. So some of it's that, and then the other part of it is going to be here handled with a high pass filter. And what you want to do there is cut some of the high frequencies. You have to be careful, and you have to use your ears and do it judiciously. Um, the more of that you cut off, the more you're going to cut, start cutting into the dialogue, into the kind of the sparkly top end of the dialogue. Um, but if you start applying that, um, that can help reduce some of the hiss as well. And that's where most of the hiss is. You're not going to get all of it. It's not going to be perfectly clean. Um, but but getting some of that there and some on the low end will help take care of hiss and uh, it's kind of the, the noise floor. Another thing you can do then is from there, if you just highlight a section of silence, maybe between dialogue and silence, I use in quotes because it's not silent and that's the problem. Um, but if you come over here and use your noise reduction capture noise print and then go back into effects noise reduction that's where you can start to use this noise reduction filter here in adobe audition and that works pretty well and the main idea here is that you probably want to take your noise reduction you don't want to 
you don't want to get too aggressive on this because then you start sounding robotic. I'd start somewhere in the 50% range. And then in terms of the noise or reduced by amount, um, go a little less extreme on that. 100 dB is a lot. <laughs> You're probably going to want to be in the 10 to 20 range, typically. And uh, I would just just work with those two parameters first. If you start getting too advanced, you're going to get yourself confused. I get myself confused, at least using that under most circumstances until you get a little bit more familiar with this. But as a start, again, you know, you can tweak this noise reduction amount here and then tweak the amount that you're actually reducing it by in terms of decibels here. Again, between 10 and 20 on that is where I typically start. Usually dial this to about 50 and kind of tweak it from there. I can't play it for you right here to actually demonstrate it fully, but those are the main ideas. Um, if you have a larger budget, um, I will be honest, in most cases I'm using Isotope RX4 Advanced. So what I'll do is I'll actually bring this over into Isotope. Now I have to share that one second. So you can see that. I'm gonna stop sharing that. And instead we're going to show uh, it doesn't show isotope. In any case, um, actually, let me go ahead and start isotope separately. Is it starting? Uh, let's see. Sorry for the delay here. Let's see if I'll try it one more time here, see if this gets it. Ah, there it is. Okay. Yep. So RX4 Advanced, um, this is an expensive software. I realize that. I'm not toting, suggesting that everyone needs to use this, obviously. But um, on, the, on the bigger budget jobs, and in fact, most motion, major motion pictures, large budget, are using this. The sound designer, designers are using this. Um, but let me just show you what the um, noise reduction sounds like in here. They have this denoise module. The night, one of the nice things about this is it's super quick and super easy. So you have a couple tabs, you've got the spectral, which works very much like in the Adobe Audition, like we were just looking at, but we also have this dialog denoiser, which is sort of optimized for dialog. It's super easy. All you do is you um, go ahead and start playing through it with a preview. You can change the threshold and you can change the reduction amount. And then once you've got it dialed in and it's sounding good, and you can actually play it in real time to hear what it's doing, just like in Adobe Audition. But then once you're done, you click process and it's done and you're on your way. This actually does a slightly better job, I think, than Adobe Audition. Um, and you can, you've got a couple of modes. You've got a manual mode where you can actually kind of dial in where you want to do the cuts, or you've got an auto mode that just automatically figures out what's dialogue and what's not. And this is very transparent if you apply it judiciously again. Um, but that's, that's one of my favorite dialogue denoisers, I realize again. Not the place to start. People don't have the budget for that typically when you're getting started, so totally understand that. But just to give you an idea of, of what people are doing. So I hope I, <laughs> that was a long way to answer your question. I hope that was helpful for you. And uh, thanks for the question. Okay. Another question from Manchester Music UK. I was wondering what DB should I keep my max audio level at for YouTube? What DB do you use when uploading videos to YouTube? Thanks again. I hope you don't mind the questions. I love the questions. Thank you for that. That is a, that's a complex question. There, there are a couple of different things to consider. When, when you're talking about the overall loudness of your audio, there are at least two different ways to think of that. There are peak, there's peaks, and the peaks, um, you know, can come all the way up to zero. And then there's also what I would call integrated loudness. Integrated loudness is the overall perceived loudness, and that's not so easy to see visually. But let me just show you a couple of things here. We're going to go back into Adobe Audition. I need to share that. There we go. All right, in Adobe Audition, 
I'm going to undo this. So when I first got my audio in, this is what it looked like when I first brought this audio in. When I was recording during production, I was aiming for peaks at about minus 12. You can see it actually came in a little bit hotter than that, but I still have plenty of headroom here. You know, I've got at least 8 dB of headroom. When I go out or when I actually am done and getting ready to export my video, this is what I want it to look like instead. Let me just pull up the example this came from. This is what I want it to look like instead. You can see my peaks now are coming up to about minus 1.5 dB on the top and the bottom, but it definitely looks louder than this. And let me just convert this to stereo so you can compare apples to apples a little better. There you go. So this is what it would look like when I first came in. This is the same clip of audio once I've loudness normalized it. And this is what I want it to look like. Again, talked about this on the channel. So there's an episode there. Let me just do the, <clears throat> excuse me, the process real quick here for you. So the way I would do this, what I'm aiming for is if I've got a stereo track, I want this to be at a loudness of minus 16 LUFS. And that's completely different than D, well, it's different than DB. It's loudness units full scale. So in Adobe Audition, I've got this match volume panel. If you don't have it, you come up to window and choose match volume. Then once I've kind of got my audio about where, you know, sounding like I want it to sound, I would actually come into here, drag the audio file into the match volume panel, choose my loudness. And again, I'm going to be using ITUR BS 1770. That's just, there's several options here. Use that. And then I put this at minus 16 LUFS. I click the use limiting checkbox and then just leave these at their default. Look ahead time, 12 milliseconds, release time, 200 milliseconds and run that. Let me show you what happens. See how it made everything louder, it increased the amplitude of all of those. Now this one still has some issues. I wouldn't just do it like this here. We've actually got some clipping going on. You can see the waveform actually hits zero dB. That's a big problem. Um, so I wouldn't actually do this, but that, that's the main idea of how you get your audio to the right loudness level. So let's undo that. I'm gonna do some other things first. Because it was clipping, what I need to do is I need to manage some of these peaks here. And there's some things I could do to make that work. So the first thing I'm going to do is do some compression. So I'm just going to come up here to effects, amplitude and compression. Let's just pull the single band compressor. Now I'm not going to be able to do a full <laughs> here on the spot, a full um, review of how to use a compressor, but here's the main idea. See right above this window here, I want to bring those peaks and kind of pull them down into the, to the body of the rest of the audio here right around there. So I want to set my threshold to, minus 15 dB. That's where I've got the top of the window right now. So I'll go ahead and set this threshold, minus 15. I'm going to use a ratio in this case, since I'm really only affecting these kind of transient peaks. Not, it's not like a large part of the audio, just the, the little peaks that are sticking out. I could go a little bit more aggressive on the ratio. I might choose a three to one ratio. My attack, I want it really aggressive at one millisecond. And my release, I like to leave it 150 milliseconds for most dialogue, that works really well. And then I, my output gain, I want to put it zero. I don't want to, I don't want to increase the gain on the way out. So go ahead and click apply and watch what happens to these waveforms after I apply this. See those peaks that were sticking out are no longer sticking out. So they've been kind of reined in a little bit. Now, once I've done that, now is a good time to come back over to this match volume panel here. Let's try loudness normalizing again to minus 16 LUFS. Now, by the way, if you have a stereo track, with left and right channels, you wanna aim for minus 16 LUFS. If you have a mono track, just one track, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, you wanna aim for minus 19 LUFS. That's just, those are the perceptual equivalents. So again, for stereo, we're gonna go minus 16. Again, use limiting. And again, I wanna keep my look ahead time at 12 milliseconds and my release time 200 milliseconds. Click apply. Now this time, we still got some clipping so we're going to have to go back and kind of um, manage that uh, or be a little bit more aggressive as far as the compressor is concerned. So let's go ahead and do that again. We're going to undo, also undo the compression that I did. Pull up our compressor again, amplitude and compression, single band compressor. So I got to get more aggressive here on the threshold. And it looks like these are the parts that keep getting clipped once I do everything here. So let's 
let's get a little more aggressive. Let's go minus, well, we could go minus 18 or we could even go minus 24. Let's go minus 24 and see what happens. I'm going that aggressive on the threshold. I might ease up on the, the ratio a little bit. So I'm going to go two five on the ratio, click apply. Okay, made them look really tiny, huh? <laughs> Let's try applying the loudness normalization again, see what we get this time. Okay, that's a lot more reasonable. So you can see now we're not clipping on these peaks here. And that's pretty good. The problem I have though, is that when I loudness normalize, one of the other things I need to do is I need to make sure that my true peak amplitude doesn't get too crazy. So what I can do to measure that, you can't really tell visually, but if I come over here into the amplitude statistics panel, and if you don't have that in Adobe Audition, to go to window and choose amplitude statistics, go ahead and scan. And this tells me a, a lot of different stuff. So it tells me, first of all, my loudness is minus 16 LUFS. So we're good there. But what we have as a problem here is this amplitude, a true peak amplitude is at minus 0.41 dB true peak. We really want that at minus 1.5 or lower. So we've got a problem we have to address here. And the way we can do that is, you know, ideally you have a true peak limiter. Adobe Audition doesn't come with one. And to be honest, um, I'll typically use, I have one in Isotope, so I'll use that a lot of times, but you can do it manually as well. All you have to do is come into effects, amplitude and compression, hard limiter. Now this is in itself is not a true peak limiter, but we can kind of use it like one. And let me show you what I mean here. So let's just start at minus 1.5. We'll set our maximum amplitude to minus one, oh, whoops, minus 1.5, <laughs> not minus 15. Um, I'm gonna leave my input boost at zero, look ahead time seven milliseconds and release time 100 milliseconds. Click apply. And what that's gonna do is that's gonna manage these peaks that are up above minus 1.5. So it's going to actually just chop them off. Now you can see it actually literally just chopped them off. <laughs> and that isn't going to, you don't want to do too much of that. A little bit of that you can usually get away with, but you don't want to do a ton of it because then you'll start to hear it. It will sound distorted. Um, you can usually get away with a little bit of it. And once I've done that, I come back here to the amplitude statistics again, rescan it. You can see now we're at minus 1.3 dB true peak. So we're getting closer which means we gotta come back in here, go back to amplitude and compression, hard limiter. Let's drop this down to minus 1.6. See if that gets us where we need to be. Come over here to amplitude statistics again, rerun it. Now we're at minus 1.4 dB true peak. You can see this is an iterative process. You got, <laughs> this is what you have to do if you don't have a true peak limiter. Um, so I'm gonna come down to minus 1.7. The problem is, is if you have to get too extreme with this, you're gonna start chopping off a lot of these waveforms and it's gonna to start to sound funny. Okay, so once we got down to minus 1.7 on the hard limiter, that gets us down to minus 1.54 dB true peak. So overall, that's how I do my loudness normalization, kind of. I mean, that's, that's kind of the quick and dirty way of doing it. Um, you can see there's another problem here. We can't really address that here, but notice the waveforms look bigger on the top side than they do on the bottom side. This is pretty common with men's voices and certain microphone combinations. Not all men's voices do it, but a lot do. And um, there are some things you can do to fix that as well. Unfortunately, again, Adobe Audition doesn't have those plugins available by default. You have to actually go find them. And watch this, here's, a, here's an example of one I do have. I think I have it installed here. Yeah, press work. This is actually a compressor, <laughs> but I have all the compression settings turned off and I have this right here, which is called dual phase rotation. If I just apply that, watch what happens to the waveform. It kind of evens it up a little bit more. So it's not sticking out so much. Um, that's not the best one I have, um, but there are others as well. In any case, there are lots of lots of things you can do for dialogue audio post-processing that get really kind of into the weeds. I want to just sort of back up. Don't worry about that stuff. Let's just, just learn the basics first. Uh, learn how to compress and learn how to loudness normalize like we just showed you there. And that's a big, big start. So to answer your question, that was a long way. The short answer, Manchester Music UK, is uh, you need to, first of all, 
compress the audio to manage the links or the, the peaks a little bit. And then from there, um, I do some true peak limiting. Let's take that back off, back to the screen here. Hey, we have our friend here. <laughs> Hello. Welcome. Thank and you. I, I see we, we're, we're, called, we're going by Angels Whispering today. Is that right? Oh, Angel is fine. Angel's Whispering, Angel. unscripted blogger. So can you hear me well? How, how, am, I, how am I coming across? Beautifully. Thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. I'm so, so glad. Good. I really was so excited. Finished work, ran home literally in the storm because I knew this was going to be, you know, something I wanted to be part of. So I'm here. It's awesome. What time is it there? Uh, it's 5.49 a.m. Beautiful start of the day. And hey, good everybody. Morning. Hope everyone's good. <laughs> Very good. Well, really? Angel, tell, tell us how things are going. So you, you have, um, you have, Kind of start down a path. You have a ch couple of channels on YouTube, I see. So you're getting lots of practice in terms of audio production. Yes. Post production. Yes. And absolutely. One of, those, one of them is really audio focused. It's actually mm. ASMR. Is that is that the right term for it? That's right. Auto yeah, autonomous sensory meridian response. I mean, that's the long winded version of this. When I first started my journey down sound, love. I came across ASMR and it's completely sound focused. We are ASMR artists that make sounds specifically to relax people. So we use everything and anything that is sound in order to create a relaxing environment. And it could be the sound of rain mixed with anything at all. I mean, you, you can't, we know as sound enthusiasts that sound is a phenomenal way to engage people in how they feel, their health and well-being, um, their mental clarity. So I came across ASMR at a very important time of my life after an accident and sound literally changed my life. But I didn't know anything about sound. I mean, I was, I sucked. I was so bad. I didn't know <laughs> anything at all. Um, and then I began learning about sound from YouTube and trying to find ways to improve my sound quality, which was horrendous, horrendous. I used microphones from a camcorder. Which, I mean, it was now looking back, what a story. I mean, it's so amazing that I've come so far. But when I found your channel, ah, look, look I've got a mentor in sound engineering, but you learn different things from different people and YouTubers, it's one of the best environments to learn from. So yeah, Angels Whispering ASMR is a dedicated sound channel. The problem is there is a point where you become bored. There is, you can master, I mean, I love Isotope. Oh my gosh, when I found Isotope, I promised myself that I would marry that program. I want all <laughs> of RX. I mean, I love it. The uh, problem is when you're working with ASMR in a beautiful, quiet environment, even though this is my home and I don't have, what do you call it, a, um, I don't have a studio. So I had to learn how to audio restore and how to create the most beautiful sound because that's, what that's basically what will relax people. But you get bored. I wanted to be able to go out on location and be able to get different sounds and horrible sounds. And how do I sweeten that? How do I make that work? So I, I do things as in the unscripted vlog channel. I go everywhere so I can get all those sounds and come back and somehow make a video that I can be proud of to, you know, like I just made one. I went to a country western race day. Every single shot had the worst sound possible you could possibly capture on any microphone from any angle. And then I was able to bring that together. So that's my practice is my unscripted vlog channel so that I can make beautiful sound in the ASMR channel. There you go. That's me. There we are. Very good. Yeah, I think, you know, and, and that's the thing. I don't want to scare people away here. I, I love Isotope as well. The, the reality is, is Isotope, advanced which has all of the mm. you know all of the features all the cleaning stuff one thousand two hundred dollars us and yeah. that's a that's a really steep entry point <laughs> yes so, yes so not very but, achievable for us enthusiasts but but there are a lot of things you can do even without that and i don't i want people to understand that is i think like the biggest biggest thing that we've talked about a ton is that 
if you can get that microphone in close to your talent, you can mm. get 90% of the way there. You know, I was told, Angel, do yourself a favor, learn the basics and master those basics. Forget about all the shabam, wham, post-production stuff. Learn how to do it properly in the first place. Get the sound quality that you like on location, do all that. Then as you progress and you get better, you can work with really good quality product. So I agree, Isotope is fantastic, but start off like I did, slow learn about the microphones, learn about what it means when someone says negative three dB, you know, in post-production later. Learn what it means to actually record in a, um, from your ear, listen to your environment. You know, if you're recording and speaking to someone, is there a plane, is there a train, is there an automobile surrounding? Wait until that's done and then continue recording. So yeah. Yeah, for sure. And I think um, here, here is a, here's a good question. Daniel Jones uh, says, thanks, Curtis, for your theater answer. I'll tap into the soundboard always if available. I also wouldn't mind hearing about your biggest audio mess up and how you dealt with it. I've had a few human errors recently, but luckily was okay in the end. And in fact, I um, talked about that a little earlier. So I had a, a production a gig earlier this week, again, a video, uh, corporate video piece that we were doing. Um, we had a director and a producer there. And it was, a, it was a challenge. So they had done the location scouting. They had decided where they wanted to shoot for each of the three scenes that we shot. Um, one of them was, was a, just a great little place. It was actually in the office for this business. Um, it was in their little lunch area. And that actually was a pretty surprisingly decent area. It, had, it was carpeted for the most part. And then, um, you know, just in terms of sound, if you went in that room, it was okay something that was totally, totally usable. The other one that we had was this, um, it was over in the cubicle area, in the work area. And um, by itself, it wouldn't have been a horrible place, but I, I had mentioned this, I apologize for those that were here on, at the very start, I actually talked about this a little bit, but um, there, was, there were white noise generators in the ceiling every 10 feet. So there are okay. actually speakers putting out white noise um, which is makes actually for a, not a bad workspace, but it makes for awful recordings. And then we also, the way they had the, that little particular scene blocked out, the actress was actually standing right within the, um, the trajectory of a vent for the air conditioner. So okay. now she has uh, wind blowing at her as well. <laughs> and, you know, we had to stop and I had to say, guys, you're really, sh you know, are you really sure you want to do it here? This, these are the issues we're up against. You're going to hear it. And uh, mm -hmm. they decided in the interest of time, they needed to just go ahead. Um, so, so we went ahead and we shot it and sure enough, it sounds like she's in a wind tunnel. Um, so, <laughs> so two things in terms of kind of addressing that situation, Daniel, I think it's a great question. Um, they're going to get what they're going to get. In, in this particular case, fortunately, there's a music bed underneath the dialogue. So that's going to help a little bit. But what we had to do is after the scene, I had to capture some room tones. So I just had a recording of the sound of the room, no talking. Um, and, and I was able to bring that back for post-production and lay that layer that back in. So what I did is I took the dialogue audio, particularly from the actress. The actor's dialogue was actually pretty good from the actress who was standing right underneath this vent and we had the white noise. Um, well, I had to do some cleanup. So I could have done that in Adobe Audition. I actually used RX since I have RX, but you could do the same thing in Adobe Audition where you just apply the, the noise reduction. And actually what I did is I manually went in the gaps in her dialogue and actually silenced that out. So it sounds awful. In fact, I can show it to you here. Um, let me see if I can pull it up here. I'm gonna share. Audition. Actually, you know what? I uh, I just realized I don't have it. <laughs> it's, on, it's on an external drive that I don't have here right now. Okay. In any case, so I actually silenced the gaps between her dialogue. Actually highlighted it, go up to effects, and choose silence. And that totally removed everything in between. So when you listen back to that one track, it sounds awful. It sounds like she'll say something with a bunch of noise. Um, and then it'll be complete silence. It's very obvious. However, once I laid that into the final piece mm. with the room tone underneath it, it actually sounds quite good. It sounds much cleaner than it would, would have otherwise. And um, we still kind of were able to blend those two back together in a way where I was able to remove some of the noise from her dialogue pieces, 
but then add back some of that room tone. So it does, it sounds very natural. It doesn't jar the viewer out of the, the watch, the viewing experience. Um, so I guess that's Daniel, kind of one of the <laughs> one of the mistakes. I probably should have been a little bit more insistent. I also, what we didn't have time to do is I should have asked the office manager or the facility manager there, is there any way to turn off that white noise generator? Um, because those are a disaster as far as audio is concerned. So that's another kind of lesson learned there. I probably should have pursued that a little bit more. Probably should have gotten there a few minutes earlier so that we could have kind of talked through that that kind of situation. So. I don't know, Angel, do you have any experiences where you've completely biffed it and what did you do to fix it? Oh, boy, you know, truthfully, I've done so many recordings where trying to, this is something which is important for people to know. You can try in post-production to clean up, but the truth is if you don't get a really nice, clean audio sound sample in the first place, you can go ahead and try your hardest. It's never quite there. So I've got a lot of footage that I have done and simply I don't use it because I can tweak it and then bam, shabam, I'm not happy with it. I just, I, it's not good enough. So, um, you know, it, it's, yeah, I, I prefer actually doing it right the first time. Post-production is fantastic, but I really love being on location, making sure that I'm listening to what I'm, my surroundings. And then I go from there. Plenty of problems, believe me, plenty. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, I get marked. Um, my mentor, I pretty much speak to my mentor every third day. If I don't see my mentor in the studio, um, because he teaches at a very large university, so I can't afford to go to school and he teaches me and I help out in other ways as his assistant sometimes and that's how I learn too. So I work on other projects, you know, about that silencing, all that sort of stuff. So I like, um, I do restoration for voice, especially voice artists when they're singing. And um, yeah, if, if it's not good enough, he says, scrap it, do it again. And I'll go back out on location and do it again until it's right and go back and say, what do you think about this? It is horrendous when you do it wrong. And he's just, it's actually quite good practice because when I go out, I am always looking and listening. When I say looking, I look at anything. Those vents that you talk about, oh my gosh, that white noise. You just become more attuned to it. Yeah. So, um, you know, tough love works. <laughs> Absolutely. Tough love Absolutely. works. And that's also a case, I think, for um, monitoring. While you're recording, you've got to have the set of cans, headphones on, mm -hmm. so you can yep. actually hear what's going on. And in fact, that was how I knew in this production case that I knew something was going on and it wasn't going to be pretty. So <laughs> we stopped and yeah. we, you know, it was a producer's choice. We could we could move locations and find somewhere that was going to work better or we could just go for it. They opted to go for it. So that was their choice and that's fine. Well, you know, to roll with those kind of things too, but, but uh, definitely some things to consider there. We have a new joiner here, Jason. Hey, Jason. How are you? Hi there. How are you going? Good, thanks. Good. How are you? <laughs> Good. Good. Glad you could join us here. Um, you. Do you have any questions you'd like to discuss? I actually do have a question. Um, and my question is about uh, introducing other, basically other cables into the, um, into your chain, your, your uh, collection chain. So, for example, I've got a video mic pro and if I wanted to boom that, the cable's like two inches long, so I'd have to get a 3.5 mini cable. How much of it issue is that and how much of an issue the quality of the cable what do you have to look for in those cables that's just sort of yeah. Um, yeah okay yep those are good that's a good question so that's the, that's the big advantage as you probably know of XLR cables XLR cables yeah. are balanced which which of course means that you know you're getting the benefit of it's able to resist interference um, from other things especially power cables and things of that nature quite nicely so that's the ideal situation. Otherwise, <laughs> the 3.5 millimeter unbalanced cables, which a lot of us are using. So, for example, I've done, I've had a Rode Video Mic Pro, which has the unbalanced 3.5 millimeter cable out at the end of a boom before. I use Rode has um, their VC1 cable, I believe it is. So it's a 10 foot extension for for that particular case, and that works pretty nicely. I've never gotten any interference issues with that particularly. So I think. You know, this is a case where I would actually say, and there are lots of those cables out on the market. I mean, there are gazillions of them. You can get them 50 feet long if you want to. The problem is the longer you go, the more chance you have of picking up interference. 
Also, the mm -hmm. quality of the shielding within the cable makes a difference as well, potentially. I've had really good luck with the Rode VC1. It's only 10 feet, so it's not really long, but it's usually just long enough to get it out where you need it. Um, so I would stick with, with a name brand like that if you can. Um, and that's going to make a difference. Monoprice tends to have pretty decent quality, especially if you go, they have various grades of cables. If you can go with something that's a little bit on the higher end, that can make a difference as well, if you're familiar with there. I don't know if they, do those guys ship to Australia? I, I'm gathering. Don't know. You have no idea. Yeah, I, have. <laughs> I don't know either. <laughs> uh, but monoprice.com is, is a great source for cables of all sorts. In any case, I would, if you, if you can, I'd probably try it. Don't, don't go too cheap on those. I think you could often, okay. you could often be disappointed. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you bet. You bet. All right, then there's one last uh, question here from Jenny FTOL. Curtis, enjoying your show. I have a question about a specific setup if you feel you could cover it. I'd like to create a static recording setup for two actors to be able to create pieces for their show reels or for audition tapes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I can share with you my biases and opinions <laughs> and, my ex and based on my experience. I would say, you know, when I'm doing talking head type videos, there, it seems to me a no-brainer to use a boom mic instead of a lavalier mic. Lavalier mics are mm -hmm. super convenient and they solve some very you know, persistent kind of production issues that you run into. If you've got actors that are moving around and you don't have a boom mic and you don't have a boom operator, I totally understand. Sometimes you have to go with the lavalier mic. And in fact, my production earlier this week, that's what we had to do. They weren't, they weren't hiring a boom op and uh, we had our only option was really lavaliers. So we went lavaliers because the actors were moving around a fair bit. So um, I would go with boom mics if you possibly can. Um, and by boom mics, I'm talking about either a shotgun microphone or some sort of cardioid microphone. Those would be my kind of my first choice. Um, I don't know, Jenny, um, if you have more detail in terms of, are, are they going to be having like a dialogue scene where the two of them are talking back and forth? So in that case, you're going to need probably two mics. Typically, it's best if you can get a, an isolated mic for each of the different actors or actresses. Um, that's ideal. If you can't, you have to back the mic up a little bit. Um, typically, I think a cardioid is going to work a little bit better than a shotgun mic. Shotgun mics have very, very focused pickup patterns. They tend to be, you know, very, very focused on getting that voice. <laughs> but what uh, cardio is a little bit more forgiving. They, they roll off a little bit more on the side. So if you can put it, if you have a single, um, oh, okay, here, here's a response from Jenny. Jenny, thanks for that. I was thinking of a Zoom H1 with a Rode Stereo Mic Pro boomed over their heads. Okay, that's good. That, that actually I think is a good choice, definitely. Um, the, the challenge with those two mics, the Zoom H1 in particular is a stereo, and actually the Rode Stereo Mic Pro, both stereo mics. Um, typically they have an XY pattern, so the, the microphones are kind of oriented like that, or like that. And the challenge with that is that it's going to have a wider pickup pattern. So that's, that's actually okay, but the problem is, is you're going to want to manage the room ambiance because you're going to get a lot of room ambiance with a, with a setup like yeah. that. The, I think the secret there is you're going to probably want to get as many soft things hanging to prevent the, the sound from reflecting off yeah. of the walls and coming back. And I think that's going to be the biggest challenge. Um, that doesn't have to co cost a lot of money, though. You can get uh, duvets or bedspreads or whatever you call them. <laughs> and if whatever you can do to suspend them on the walls, if for whatever is not going to be in the frame itself, suspend those on the walls to prevent that sound from reflecting off the walls and coming back into the mic is probably the biggest thing you could do. You can also put them on the floor out of, you know, out of the frame as well. And that can make a huge, huge difference. Um, oh, okay, a Video Mic Pro actually is, is one thing. You, nice thing with the Video Mic Pro is it's going to reject some of that sound. But in any case, I think it still applies here. You're going to want to get as much as you can to prevent the, the reflections and reverb from coming back and getting to the mic. But I think, yeah, with those two mics, I think you can definitely make a pretty good recording with, uh, with two different actors there. So um, you'll want to get them boomed up above and pointing down. And ideally what you're going to want to do is just place them just out of frame and point it at the mouth. Or, you know, sometimes people point them just at the chest, just below the mouth. That, that tends to attenuate a little bit of the sibilant sound, which is the the sizzly sound from the S's and the C's. Um, but if yeah. you can do that, that can make a pretty nice recording. So I hope, Jenny, that I hope that was helpful for you. 
Some thoughts enjoy there. it. Yeah, enjoy it for sure. Jason, Angel, any other advice you have for Jenny? Uh, yeah, you know what? It's trial and error. Take, take, don't stress your actors out, but take, take after take and, and then combine it all together. Just keep recording. Just keep recording. Yeah, that's, that's the best way to learn, really. Just keep going for it. Jason, any thoughts on your side? Whoops, you're muted oh, there. Okay. There we I very much. <laughs> I haven't had very much practice yet. Yeah. Um, yep. For sure, for sure. Um, Jenny also asked a follow-up question here. Would muslin sheets, backdrops work? I was thinking of putting some carpet cutoff down to, this is in a small garage. Yeah, absolutely. I think anything you can do to would help. Muslin sheets can actually help quite a lot. In fact, backdrops, a lot of times if I'm doing a talking head and we've got a backdrop in the room, that does a lot to attenuate a lot of the reflection and the reverb. So. For sure, that'll help so, Jenny. What's a muslin sheet? I'm sorry. Yeah, muslin is actually just a term. It's a. It's actually a type of fabric. It's a kind of a heavy cotton fabric. And oh, okay, all right. No, That's all good. Photography, photography, and videography terms typically they're referring to, when they say a muslin, it's usually a backdrop, like a fabric backdrop. Ah, oh, okay, all right. Yeah. I thought um, muslin here is um, cheesecloth. <laughs> ah, okay. Cheesecloth. It's very right. very light. Cool. Yeah. All right. I just learned that, something that, new. Yeah. Muslin and that and those terms probably wouldn't help quite as much. You need something a little denser. <laughs> in <laughs> uh, in the United States, when we refer to muslin, typically it's a um, it's a pretty heavy cotton. Um, right. So it's cool. It's actually, yeah. Um, oh, and then one last question here from Jenny. Uh, I'm mostly nervous about whether to use one mic or two. If I need to, the H1 only covers one channel. Um, yeah, you could do that with the Zoom H1. You could actually, what, I don't think there's a way to turn off on the Zoom. I have it right here, in fact. If that tells you anything, I've still got my Zoom H1 hanging around right here. I actually also have Tascam DR05. We just got that one and we're mm -hmm. going to do a review and kind of compare those two. But I don't know if there's a way on the Zoom to turn off during the recording to record just one channel. However, when you get this into post-production, you can actually just drop one of those channels. But that's not a problem at all. So, um, yeah, you could definitely do that as well. And then what you'd want to do, you can see, again, how the microphones are oriented in this XY. I would just have one of them aimed at your actor that you use that one for, and then you can drop the other channel. And it'll be very obvious once you get into post which channel you need to drop. It won't, it won't have as much uh, amplitude on the... Uh, on that particular recording. So, yeah, Jenny, I hope that that's a great idea. You could do that as well. That way, you're you're essentially using a cardioid microphone for that one actress or actor, and then the shotgun mic on the other actor. That's a great idea. It it is clear to me that you have some creative abilities, and that you'll do a fine job learning how to do this. So good work Thank on that. You. And then also, um, you noted here the muslin you have is more like a heavy velvet. Yeah, exactly. And that's perfect. That that's a good heavy fabric is what you want there to kind of attenuate the the sound. So that's good. All right. We also have our friend Stephen that just joined us. Stephen, welcome this morning. How are you? I'm fine. Yourself? Very good. It's uh it's pretty early for you as well. I think you're in the United States here in Austin, Texas. Is that right? Yes, correct. Yeah. It's uh, yeah. So okay. I woke up at okay. five, but I have to get my coffee. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Very good. Awesome. Uh, Jenny had a, a one more follow-up question here. She's confused about the H1 now. I thought it had one input channel for one mix. It actually is a stereo recorder, Jenny. So what that means is that when you record, let me just turn it on here see if that, you'll notice on the, uh, I don't know if you can see that. Can you see that? Yes. Okay. You see that it has uh, the little peak meters. We have two of them, one on the right, one on the left. It's actually recording to a uh, stereo um, recording, so it's actually recording two channels, a left channel and a right channel. So you're actually getting a stereo recording there. Stereo, just in this case, um, stereo, the term stereo could be very confusing, by the way. Stereo, uh, there's true stereo and there's what I would call dual mono. Um, so it can be confusing here. In this particular case, you're recording actually two different microphones and they can come in, the, the two different microphones can capture a signal at two different levels. So um, what you're getting is actually a true stereo recording, and you can just drop one of those. The, the thing that I think a lot of people forget is that 
dialogue or sound from a person is mono. It's just one source. It's just coming from one place. Um, what stereo does is it kind of puts it in a space and it makes it more three-dimensional potentially. I would say that when you're recording um, when you're recording dialogue and when you're first getting started, I wouldn't mess with stereo. Stereo gets awfully complicated awfully quickly and you can get all sorts of strange things going on that are going to be difficult to solve. You can get comb filtering. So for example, when you're talking in an area and you're getting a dialogue stereo recording, yes. You're going to get reflections off the walls, and when those reflections come back, they actually kind of do what's called comb filtering. They come back and they interfere with the primary uh, vocals, yeah. and so then you start getting things that start sounding very, very strange. So <laughs> to be honest, <laughs> it's always best for dialogue when you're getting started in particular. Um, just go with a mono recording of, vo of vocals because you're gonna, it's going to get really complicated if you try to do that. So, Jenny, if you can, you, I think you'll see what I mean is, you know, I don't know what you're using for uh, um, editing your audio. If you're just using Audacity, you'll, you'll, when you import the audio from the Zoom H1, you'll get a stereo, you know, two-track recording that comes in. You can actually, over at the track header, there's a way to actually drop one of those. Or actually what you do is you split them up, first of all, and then you just delete the one you don't want. And uh, that'll give you a much easier time of getting where you want to be. So, all right. I think we got all of those questions addressed. Thanks again, Jenny. Those were great questions. Stephen, yes. do you have any questions for us this morning? Um, so far, no. I'm fine. So far, no. Okay. Thanks for joining us, though. That's I really appreciate that. The bad news is I need to get my daughter to school. <laughs> so I need to drop off here the next couple minutes. Does anyone have any other questions or little topics they'd like to to talk about here for the last five minutes or so? Not for me. I I definitely will actually compile a list of questions for the next run because there are a few things that I really want to address just for me that might actually help somebody else. And it all really is to how to get um, not just the best, but something really... No, I won't even go into it now. Oh, now I'll wait. I'll wait. <laughs> I'll have about five questions. I will wait, because I get too excited. And we want you to definitely get your little girl to school, yeah? So. <laughs> <Very good. laughs> Thank you. No, and that's... that's and, I, and I can't promise I can answer all of them, Angel. I think you, you've got a mentor <laughs> there. We might have to re lean on him or her as well, so... <laughs> mm -mm. Oh, yeah, trust me. I might actually drag my mentor one day just to... to um come in and say hello because it's it would be fun. Fantastic, would love that. Thank you so much. Jason, any uh, parting thoughts or questions from your side? Oh, no, not really, but I'd just like to say thank you for running these, so thanks. Oh, the pleasure's mine. Thanks for joining. Glad it worked out this time. And uh, Stephen, anything else for you? Uh, no, that's far. Uh, I'll see you next session, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Okay, and actually, oh, we did have one last question that came in. All right, Mr. Cohen, let's see. Hi, Curtis, do you know of any other application that is able to control the loudness normalization? I don't want to purchase Adobe Audition. Used Auphonic, but didn't get good results. Okay, that's, that's a great question. The trick is, is that loudness normalization is, um, there's a history there, um, especially on radio and in the music world. We've had from about the, I think it really started in earnest, probably in the mid-90s, my understanding, what uh, a lot of people are now refer to as the loudness wars. And what that means in practical terms is if you listen to a, a commercially produced uh, music album from, say, the mid-80s or even the late-80s, if you just put it in and you know have your hi-fi system set at whatever volume it's set at, and then you swap that music out and you put something that went in that was produced in, say, 2005 or even mm -hmm. around 2000 uh, in the same genre of music. Let's talk about rock music or, you know, electronic or popular music of any, any sort. You put that 2005 recording in there, it's going to be, it's going to sound much louder. It's going to have a much more presence and, and just be what I like to call mastered through the roof. I mean, it just, everything is supposed to sound really, really, really loud. Um, and that's just in the mastering techniques that they use, and that's that's using it as extreme compression and limiting, all sorts of things like that. So, um, just within the last probably, I think five years, we've starting to see we started to see traction. And actually, in the United States, there was some legislation passed. I think in a lot of other in the European Union, there was some legislation passed 
about how loud, perceptually loud, programming could be that's broadcast over the air because we're also having issues where you you probably notice this as well certainly in the United States I think in Europe you've seen this as well probably in Australia and everywhere else um, you listen you're watching a TV show there's a commercial break the commercial comes on and it's just it seems like it's so much louder it's like you didn't touch the volume and suddenly it's blasting your ears and you gotta mute it um, which actually I think was kind of funny because I know our our default way of operating with that was as soon as a commercial comes on mute we're done we're not listening to this thing so <laughs> okay. um, but what what all that was is that they were using these different mastering techniques to make things loud so all this new legislation was saying no 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 everything has to be at this perceptual loud level and that's what loudness normalization is is actually making sure that your audio is loud enough so that your your audience doesn't have to crank up the volume to hear your programming but not so loud that um, it's you know it's, it's hard on people's ears and, it, and it's jarring when they move from some other program to your program. Mm -hmm. So that's the main idea. Um, what that means in practical terms, I'm sorry, it's taken a long time to get to your answer here, but the but the answer is is that um, a lot of the software that's used to do this, and even hardware, there's hardware out there for broadcast that does this as well, is actually relatively new. So it's still um, there's still a cost to it, and so. Um, for example, Adobe Audition has some tools built in it. I understand that's that's a, an application that costs a fair bit of money to, you know, now subscription model especially. It's um, fairly expensive. Um, you can do a lot of these things in Adobe Audition, um, or sorry, Audacity, but it's hard in Audacity because they don't give you a lot of the tools to do it. So I think we're kind of in this period right now where you don't have a lot of those tools in Audacity just yet, the free software for editing audio. But I think over time we'll start to see those trickle down and we'll start to see those become available. Right now, again, like I said, Adobe Audition has some of the features. Um, I heard that the newest version that will be coming out later this year, CC 2015-2 or whatever it is, it comes out later this fall, is supposed to have a true peak meter for the first time. So that'll be really helpful. Um, it already has the match volume, which um, which you know, again, will target a loudness target or standard. Um, in addition, when they bring in that true peak limiter, that'll be really helpful because then we'll have that as well. Um, it also in the amplitude statistics panel has the, the true peak reading and also the loudness reading. So we're starting to get more and more of it, but right now I don't know of any free tools that really have <clears throat> the ability to do that, unfortunately. So that's the unfortunate answer, but hopefully that's helpful for you. I think Adobe Audition is the least expensive that I know of that has a lot of those loudness tools available right now. So I, I would love to see, oh, actually, I take that back. There is one other thing to consider. I haven't looked at this in a lot of detail, but I just learned there is now a free version of Pro Tools from Avid. And I don't know that it has a lot of those tools, but there's there's potential there. <laughs> um, so if you're an Audacity user, Pro Tools first is what it's called. So if you go to the Avid website, that's avid.com, um, they now have a Pro Tools first, which is a free version of Pro Tools. And I'll have to look at that in a little bit more detail here in the next little bit to see if we get any loudness tools in that. So that's definitely uh, something worth checking. If you don't have those tools, what I can say, if you're posting something, for example, on YouTube, you can just do compression and regular normalization and then do your best at true peak limiting. What I would do is for peak limiting, in that case, if you don't have any of those tools, I would actually peak limit to minus two dB. That's gonna be the safest thing to do so that you won't have any clipping. And the reason I go minus two dB is because once you, once you actually export your video and it converts that audio to a more compressed format, some of those peaks can creep up a little bit. So you want to probably, again, limit to minus 2 dB in that case. So, All right, I hope that was helpful. Well, thanks, everyone, for joining today. We'll have another one of these next week. I'll send out a, um, if you watch the Google Plus page, you'll see the schedule there. Also, for those that are enrolled in the, um, in the class, I'll send out a direct email to you to let you know what time we're going to do this. I'd like to thank everyone for joining, especially our three webcam uh, friends here. Thanks, everybody. We'll talk to you again next week. Take care. See you later. Good day. Bye, guys. Bye. See ya. Bye.